What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, gonna have a, a kind of more open, general kind of conversation and just walk through of, you know, the, the kind of idea of traveling with Lumix cameras. You know, uh, for those that have been watching uh, the stream for the last couple of months or weeks, you know that I've been, you know, kind of on the road for the last two, well, actually for two weeks. I was home last week, but I've been on the road, which meant, you know, I had to take a look at all of my equipment that I have and come up with a plan of what kind of kit I want to put together when traveling internationally, but then also when traveling domestically for the second half of my trip. And for those that are new to this, this channel, we're based in the U.S., so that meant uh, the first travel going from the United States into Japan, and then the second travel was just, you know, crossing up into where was I? Minneapolis uh, for a week. So that gave me an idea leading up to those two trips to say, well, these are things that I think a lot of us just do passively, but have very different opinions on, you know, what camera equipment to bring, what lenses do you side, decide to bring, what kind of computer or software do you work with while you're on the road? And I wanted to take this time and actually just kind of just generally talk about it with everybody and kind of show you what my logic is when I go uh, and work on the road because I still do have to do, you know, video recordings for training content for Lumix Live. Uh, if you watched the Lumix Live that was two weeks ago, that was recorded in a hotel room while I was on the road. So I want to show you what equipment I use when I do that in the field. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a lot of these conversations throughout today. Um, should be about an hour long. It might be shorter, kind of just depends. So we're kind of winging this one a little bit. Uh, but if you have questions throughout this stream, tag at Lumix cameras, like a number of users are doing in the chat so that I can see your question and we can address them during the broadcast. And like always, those questions don't have to be specifically about traveling with Lumix cameras. They can be anything. Um, this entire platform is designed so that we all have this opportunity to just kind of connect you know, talk things through and figure out, you know, answers to questions that y'all might have. Um, so if you're new to the Lumix Live platform, like we said, these are weekly broadcasts every two, every week on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time uh, for this particular purpose. Uh, so before we start jumping into the actual equipment, I want to remind everybody in the U.S. about Lumix Pro Services. We have uh, red and platinum tier here in the United States. We have other tiers available globally. You can take a look. If you're joining us from outside of the United States, you can take a look at the link down in the description uh, where you can get information for Lumix Pro services in your region. Um, Lumix Pro services red is free. If you've purchased the Lumix camera, just follow the link on the screen or down in the description for the U.S. or global uh, and get yourself registered. It's totally free. Uh, if you're someone who likes better protection or you want just that better peace of mind, take a look at the Platinum uh, level service. That gives you an expansion of the base levels. So you get two-day repairs with free next-day shipping, 20% uh, off out of warranty repairs. Uh, you also get um, the opportunity to get loaner equipment if repairs are going to be taking longer. So if you're a working professional, that can be make or break for certain times of the year. Uh, and then you also get uh, a membership hotline. So if you prefer to speak to someone directly, uh, to troubleshoot an issue you're having, you do get that as well. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested, take a look at those links They're down in the description. We had it up on the screen as well. So um, you've got all of that. So let's uh, let's kind of jump right into this. Let's see, there, there have been a couple questions that came in. So I wanna, uh, let's address some of those first. Um, and also while we're doing that, if you have a preferred way that you like to travel with your kit, Drop that down in the chat because it could be inspiration for others that have been, you know, trying to figure out what the best method is for them, you know, kind of putting a kit together for the road. So uh, let's see here. Pete says, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Pete. Uh, Strons, hey, how are you? Uh, it says, if it doesn't fit in my backpack, it stays home. Thankfully, Lumix cameras are the perfect size. Yeah, and we're actually going to talk about the bags that I use uh, when I travel as well. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Martin says, could you please talk briefly about Cinelike D2 profiles? I can't find any official documentation on about it. Uh, gamma curve, how it works in Premiere. Uh, I can touch a little bit on it. Um, I, I would have to do a little bit more research to go in depth on it, but I can give you some of the basic information about, uh, Cinelike D2 versus the original Cinelike D. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that looks like we had some 
uh, pretty much good questions there. And then Alan's question about uh, the Lumix Tether software, if you can copy uh, custom white sets uh, within that. So I do know that that is currently not something that you can do in Lumix Tether or through camera settings is copy white balance, uh, custom white balances over. Um, but I know that we've gotten that question asked before and I know that we have passed it on to the team. I just don't know where that would be in development time. You know, is it something being worked on? Is it, you know, coming? Is it not possible? So on and so forth. So I, I would have to follow back up on that for you. Um, another question, will we see GH5 firmware updates? Probably not on the original classic GH5. Um, if you've been following the Lumix lineup, that is why the GH5 Mark II came out. Uh, the GH5 hit basically the wall of what we can do firmware update to it. So if you want a camera that's going to have much longer legs for firmware updates and potential capabilities in the future, that's what the Mark II is. It has a newer processor in it than the original Mark, uh, GH5 has. Uh, so yeah, if, if you are someone who needs a lot of firmware updates or you want a lot of firmware updates or the potential to have them, uh, the newer platform is the one you're going to basically need to go to because the original GH5 has hit a wall. Uh, for what we can really do to kind of improvement. Uh, let's see here. We see new firmware update on the G9. Um, that I'm not sure of. That does use a newer processor. Um, even if I did know, and I, I've said this a couple of times, even if I did know of firmware updates coming out or things like that, I wouldn't be able to tell you anyway. Um, that's kind of how working for a company works. But um, if there are things that, you know, you see that you want to see added to a G9, definitely let us know. There's no guarantee that they will come. Uh, but it is those things that, you know, as people give ideas, that can either be something that is firmware or are there are reasons to come out with a different camera down the line. All of that kind of stuff is what helps us grow the equipment that we use, so... Uh, let's see here. And will we see Lumix webcam software that sports M1 chip someday? Uh, it has been asked numerous times. Um, I have definitely brought it up in meetings. Uh, I know our team has brought it up in meetings. Um, I'm just not sure when it would, when it would come. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, cool. All right. Yeah. So talking about traveling with, with Lumix, you know, kind of traveling with, with the cameras. And obviously this is going to be a very Lumix oriented, you know, conversation because that's what we all do. That's what I do. And it's the cameras that we all like, but you know, w one of the things that came up when having to decide to make the trip, uh, into Japan with my equipment was, you know, which platform do I want to travel with? You know, do I want to travel with a point and shoot? Do I want to travel with micro four thirds or do I want to travel with full frame? And I think this is something that anyone that's using multiple levels of our cameras or different variants of our cameras, if you're in the different categories of these, that's going to be stuff that, you know, you probably question as well. Is it a business trip? Is it a paid job? Is it, you know, kind of more casual travel? You know, these are things that can help you determine, you know, which, which kit do we actually want to work with. And some of the core stuff really, in my opinion, comes down to what is the intent that you would want to do with your cameras while you're in the field. So for my case, the trip to Japan, I didn't actually need my camera equipment for any kind of actual work related task, right? That meant that I didn't really need to record anything for Lumix Live. That week was there, you know, I was there for business I, I, my schedule was going to be locked up. So when I would be able to go out and photograph or video, that was going to be more casual, fun experiences. And the logic I took there was, well, I want to bring something that because it's going to be in the evening, it's going to be at night. Usually when I'm going to be able to go out and do anything, I want to bring a system that is going to be really good in low light and give me the flexibility to, you know, do longer exposures to shoot at higher ISOs if I wanted to. But I also didn't want to bring a ton of equipment around because it was the first time I'd ever been to Japan. So I also want to be able to experience the city. So ultimately, the kit that I ended up settling with 
uh, for that particular trip was actually my S5. So my S5, uh, for those that have used the S5, you know that with as far as size goes and portability, you've got a full frame camera that's about the same size as a GH5. In fact, in some cases, it's, a little, it's actually a little bit smaller. And you get just you know, a powerhouse of capabilities. So I have my high resolution stills if I want to do that. I've got features like live view composite because I know I'm going to be out at night if I want to play around with long exposure. Um, I've got 4K 60p if I want to do video, but then really for me, because it's a more, tr you know, personal travel reason I'm bringing the camera, it was also, I have the lenses that I like for the kind of focal lengths I want to work with. So what kind of lenses do you decide to bring? So in this particular case, going into a city that, you know, or a location that maybe you're never really comfortable with, this is where looking at what overall system availability and lenses is, is going to be kind of a, a useful piece, right? So with the S series, and I keep pointing off to the side like, like y'all can see it, but I have all my cameras here. So as far as lenses go, because I settled, I knew I wanted to bring my S5. Now I had to look at what optics and what lenses do I want to bring. Am I going to have opportunity to shoot during the day? Am I going to have, you know, a tripod with me? Things like that come into my mind when I'm questioning this. So I looked at all, across all the lenses that we have, and I could have very easily just, you know, stuck the 24 to 72.8, the 16 to 35 f4. Uh, 70 to 200 I could have very easily taken all of those lenses and had, you know, even the 50 millimeter F 1.4 S pro taken the highest end top tier S pro kit with me. And that would have been great, but it's big, it's heavy. It's way overkill for the kind of purpose. So now you start looking at the rest of the line. That's the nice thing with the Lumix, with the S series and the L Mount Alliance is you can look and say, okay, well, what focal lengths do I like to shoot with? Do I like shooting with ultra wide? Do I like shooting more telephoto? Am I a more 50 millimeter kind of person? There are options available for all of it. So looking at every single thing that we have, and I have access to every single one of the lenses, it ended up being the entire F 1.8 series of lenses that were chosen to be brought with me. So that is the 18 millimeter, which should be shipping out to everybody soon, if not already the 24 millimeter, the 35 millimeter, the 50 mil, and then also the 85. This give this gave me that full kit of lenses to just cover anything I want. And you've got really good low light performance with it paired with camera like the S5. So for those that don't know, um, or those that are curious about it, you know, there's a lot of nice advantages with our entire F 1.8 series for one, they're tiny. So they're small lenses by comparison to things like the 50 F 1.4. Uh, but for anyone that does travel or, you know, any kind of photography or videography where you're using filters attached to any of your kit, looking at the different optics that you want to bring, whether this is for personal or this is for a more professional job, looking at how you can streamline every aspect of shooting is something that I would say should be very important and is very important, at least in my, my view. So what that meant was with my entire F 1 8 series, the fact that all of the filter threads are the exact same size, they're all 67 millimeter filter threads meant that now all I have to do, because I brought a variable ND filter with me, I also brought a polarizer with me, that meant I'm only bringing one filter and one step ring at that point. So now I have the filters for all of my lenses and it's just one. I'm not having to take up extra space in my bag. I'm not having to, you know, kind of figure out how I want to add this extra piece to my equipment. So it allows me to be able to, you know, throw one filter on this in the bag and then be able to swap them across to each of these different lenses. And one of the, the parts with this too, and I want to make sure I caveat this for everybody too, is that these are just my recommendations. These are just, you know, some ideas. If you've got other ideas or you're someone who prefers zoom lenses, let everyone know in the chat, because those are big things that can help others that are trying to figure out, you know, this kind of logic and how to, how to make it work. Um, so yeah, so 
with these lenses, I have everything that I needed. I, you know, you get one filter size, you get incredibly, really high quality lenses, nice and sharp. You get really good performance in low light. And I was able to walk around confidently through Osaka with my S5 and, you know, the lens that I chose for that particular day. Um, this is also one of those opportunities where if you're someone who typically always shoots with zooms and you're going somewhere, maybe not on a trip like this if it's been your first time ever going somewhere this is where you can also take that logic and say well i'm going to pick one focal length and then that's what i'm going to shoot with and i'm going to force myself to try to find new perspectives and new you know ways of capturing my vision just with the optics that i bring with me so that's a that's part of a logic that i take too so even though i brought all of the f1.8 lenses the 18 millimeter ended up being the only lens that I actually shot with for the entire time while I was there. But, you know, the nice thing being that these lenses were light, so I still was able to have them in my bag and I didn't really have to worry too much about it. They didn't take up a lot of space and they weren't that heavy. So these lenses, if you're working in a professional sense, know that you've got a set of F1.8 lenses that'll get you shallowed up the field on full frame. You've got wide enough lenses that if you're jumping between 4K60 and 4K30, you have a wide enough angle lens that's going to, you know, adjust for the crop region for 4K60. And you can still get, you know, the benefits of things like uh, controlled focus breathing. You have similar look between all of these lenses. So the color that the lenses reproduce between each of them is going to be similar, if not identical. So optics... These ended up being the kit that I brought, S5, and then all of these. So before I continue, I saw a whole lot of comments come through the chat. So let's let's jump in and, and see some of these questions here. Uh, let's see here. Hoping for drag to focus on the GH5 Mark II. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't know if that's going to come because that was... The, the way it got changed on the GH5 Mark II was actually in response to... A lot of feedback from users that were having problems with it because of accidentally touching the screen and having it focus. But that feedback's great for us to help, you know, maybe shift the idea down the line. Um, any latest firmware updates about the S5? Uh, sorry, my dog's barking. Um, someone's at the door, I believe. Um, let's see here. Uh, please advise how to power the BS1H with V-mount, SWIT batteries with pull tap, uh, big bulky VBR batteries, and NPF for monitor, using it on sticks and some handheld works up, uh, rigged up. Okay, so uh, this actually goes into a bit of one of the other concepts of when you're traveling with equipment, you're working in the field with equipment, um, power solutions. You know, do you want to carry around a whole bunch of batteries or do you want to have maybe a more... Uh, streamlined power solution for your kit. And whether you're using a box camera, you're using an S-series camera, or you're using something like the GH6, or any, any camera now that can do things like charge over USB, I can't recommend enough things like these FX Lion um, micro V-mount batteries. These things, you know, yes, they are a little bit bigger, and they are designed as V-mount batteries, so you would normally be, like, attaching these into a rig, but if you're in the S-series cameras or you're even in the box camera, the nice thing you have with it is, for one, you've got USB-C, which is a power delivery uh, spec USB-C. So that means I can take this USB, plug it into my camera, and I know that I've got co you know constant power being provided to my cameras, or I can charge them while I'm on the go. So this usually would sit in my bag, and when I needed it, I would just you know plug the camera into it when it's in the bag and... That would give me enough charge throughout the day. But also, if you're using a camera like the box camera, you do have a D-tap out on this. And there are solutions from, I think it's Tilta, that makes a V-mount plate that you would mount this onto. And then the plate can give you 12 volt out to plug into the box camera. So something like this, this is a 50 watt hour version of it. Um, ends up being an incredibly useful tool for multiple different, you know, kind of applications. Even if, you know, you're on the go and you need to charge your phone, you've got something that can charge your phone as well, too. So when it comes to power solutions, I always recommend at least bring two 
original batteries with you for your camera. And then typically look at bringing something along, you know, lines of these. So a more traditional USB-C power brick. This one is a, I think it's a 28,000 milliamp hour. So this thing is gigantic. Uh, or something that's more video professional oriented, like a V-mount. I think even now companies like Small Rig are making similar designs to these that have your USB ports. Um, the nice advantage with this one is that you can charge it over USB-C as well. So you don't need a V-mount charger, uh, which means that this becomes a much more uh, easy to travel with device. So for Chris, this is probably, uh, this is how we power our cameras when we're at trade shows and we're working. So it should work pretty well if you're actually in the field because if you use something like the V-mount plate that I, again, I believe it's from Tilta, that would give you the ability to power your camera and the monitor if you wanted, just running off of that plate. Um, and they're relatively inexpensive. So hopefully that answers that question. Um... GH6, what about monitoring LCD info on an external monitor? It was asked long ago. Um, my understanding is that's, for now at least, that's how that system works on that camera. So it is different from the other, um, the previous Venus Engine cameras. Um, we, we constantly ask for updates though, so I don't have any other update other than how it functions right now is how it's going to function. So Chris says... Lumix, have a bag or case you recommend dropping a rig in set up so my BS1H can stay rigged up. Uh, this, this is going to be very, I think, personal uh, in these areas. So for myself, I am a backpack person. I am 100%. I prefer using a backpack. I prefer using a Peak Design backpack personally. Um, and in full disclosure, I did get this one... Um, from Peak Design, so I did not spend my own money on this. Uh, but, you know, it is... I am lucky enough that I have it in great, you know, kind of customized here with Lumix. Uh, but for the BS1H, even when I would be doing some local stuff around town, if I'm filming with that camera rigged up, um, usually I'll have, like, a port keys monitor. Uh, if I'm using the BS... Uh, the BGH1, it's usually the 8-18 to on it. If I'm using the BS1H, it's usually the 35 millimeter that's on it. Um, I can fit those cameras rigged up in this backpack. Um, you just have to change out the uh, inner kind of pieces for it. And it, it will work. Um, if you're someone who prefers to use things like... Uh, I think we they're called like doctor's bags... Uh, th there's a bunch of options out there. I'm not as up to date on some of those brands, so they can work incredibly nice. Um, or there's the straight up option option of going for like the small Pelicans. I'm looking down cause I'm not going to lift it up on camera, but, um, I forget what model Pelican I have, but it's about the size of my backpack. Um, that's another really good option. If you are, Traveling at the point where, like, you know, you can just put a small Pelican because with those, you can cut foam to them. You can get custom foam inserts so you can rig your kit up, just slot it in there and then travel with it. They're, they are nice to travel with. Uh, so those are probably the big options. If you like backpacks, personally, I like the Peak Design backpack, um, the everyday backpack. They do make the bigger one that has the drop in uh, kind of uh, squares for their capsules for the different camera combinations that can also be a nice thing but it's a very big backpack uh or just going to something like a pelican um it's all going to depend on, on what you're doing if you're traveling internationally or you're getting on a plane with the equipment that adds a whole nother level of what do you put your camera in are you someone that checks your camera equipment do you forcibly make sure that you carry it on a plane um these are these are things that are going to be uh, probably a little, you know, kind of situation dependent. Um, I can tell you in the closet I have next to my, my office here, I've probably got about 30 different bags. You know, day bags, backpacks. Uh, back up in, in New Jersey, I've got a ton of bags that are all sitting up there as well. There's never going to be one bag that fits every, every little thing that you want to do perfect. So um, when it comes to traveling... 
and moving your equipment around, you're going to have to look probably more situational based on the bag. Um, so with that, uh, traveling both internationally and uh, domestically here, this is the backpack that I use. This is the, I think this is the large size um, everyday backpack. Um, covers everything that I needed, fit the uh, S5 with the entire F18 series in there, uh, fit my laptop, fit, you know, hard drives, all that kind of stuff. And it, and it did it in a nice, comfortable way that I could still fit it overhead. I could still fit it under the seat if I needed to. So I didn't have to check any camera equipment with me. Um, let's see here. Um, question, I'm considering a G100 in addition to my G9. Would you recommend it? I'm also planning to use it as a B cam. Um, the G100 is actually, um, I actually do like this camera. Um, it's a small little compact camera. It still at least has the flip screen. Uh, the one thing to just remember is if you are thinking to use the G100 as a B cam to something like a G9 or another camera that has uh, 10 bit and V-log, the G100 is only an 8 bit camera. So you can use V-log in 8 bit. You just have to be very kind of spot on with your exposure to make sure that you're not pushing the 8-bit file too much. Um, so just keep that in mind with the camera. If you're shooting in like natural color profile, you're fine. Um, whether you're, you know, on the G9, GH5, or a G100. Um, it does use a slightly different, uh, or it does use a different battery uh, solution for it, uh, but it can be charged over USB. Uh, so it is a nice compact camera. The other benefit with that one uh, is that it's also... Like I said, compact. So if you just want something to just kind of tool around town with, that is a really fun camera to do that with. Uh, let's see here. Um, Sacred says, uh, where do we go to suggest this small issue? The 200 isn't as sharp focusing as the other lenses, like the 42.5. I have the updated firmware for both. Um, you can send comments to the Lumix Live at us.panasonic.com. Um, you can always feel free to do that. Uh, Chris says, uh, add nine by 16 frames to the S1H. Uh, it'd be awesome to shoot open gate and not have to just bring a monitor just for nine by 16 frame guides. Um, that's definitely been brought up and asked before. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue to bring that one up too. Um, Scholarhead, uh, can you please make pancake stabilized lenses for street uh, and travel photography? Um, I'm not an optics engineer, so I don't know if, that combination of pancake and stabilized is something that would come out and be beneficial. Uh, there is typically, if you look in the market, ultra wide lenses that have in lens stabilization that pairs with body stabilization or is just in lens only tend to not be as sharp as lenses that don't have uh, stabilization in the lens, especially when you're in a much wider angle field of view. So think like, 50 millimeter and wider. Um, that's not to say that it, it's, it wouldn't ever happen, but, um, we can ask, I just wouldn't think that a pancake and a stabilized lens would be a combination that would be possible because a stabilization system does take up space because it does have to move. Uh, if you're thinking like, you know, we want to go back to like the 20 millimeter in micro four thirds, um, and then have a stabilized version of that. Well, that lens would never be as small as it is if it had a stabilizer in it. Um, but you know, we can always bring these questions up. Uh, let's see here. Whoa. Thank you. YouTube for jumping. Um, I always wondered if, uh, this comes from Martin. I always wondered if there is any issue within changing lenses without powering off the camera. Um, any idea why it's not recommended in the manual? Uh, yeah, actually it's super easy. Uh, if you change lenses while the camera is on, the lens or the sensor has power being driven to it, which becomes static, uh, static, uh, a try. I can't speak. Uh, when the lens is off the camera and it's powered on, you're more likely to have dust become attracted to the sensor because the lens isn't there to kind of block it. Um, you should always turn your camera off when you change lenses. Um, to minimize how often you have to do um, uh, uh, sensor cleanings, things like that. So you want to be, you know, pretty pretty careful with that. 
Um, I can tell you, I'm not the most, uh, you know, kind of spot on with doing it. I do clean my sensors often because I am not that great with it. Uh, and I typically, like if I'm going out on a ride on my bike, I will literally just take my camera and throw it in my saddlebag and just ride off with it. I don't really put it in any other kind of bag when I do that. So, um, yeah, you know, you want to kind of just make sure that you turn it off, uh, because of static. Uh, let's see here. Chris says, uh, when you travel, you bring your 24 to 70 and a 35 millimeter F1.4. Yeah. Those are, they're solid, uh, options to travel with. Um, let's see here. Top is traveling, traveling with Lumix cameras. I also own a GF7. Truly com compact cameras. Where are they? Uh, is this the end of GF10 slash GM5s? Well, uh, the GM5 was discontinued years ago. Um, and I think we've kind of made it relatively kind of clear that the GM5s are probably a platform that won't come back. Um, for the time the GM5s were fun cameras, um, compared to what what is being requested cameras to be doing, uh, sizing equipment down is definitely a challenge uh, with engineering resources. And, and this is true for everybody. Um, you do hit a point where like, you really can't kind of go much smaller, uh, and still be able to do the things that you want the cameras to do, uh, across the board. You have to give up something somewhere. Um, but in general, I mean, you know, as far as the GF cameras, uh, the, I believe they're still current. They just, uh, in the U S I know we don't sell many GF cameras or, um, that particular model. Uh, so I know that they sell pretty well overseas, uh, outside of the U S um, we still have cameras like the LX100 Mark II, which is still a really solid, you know, travel companion camera if you want something that's fixed lens, um, but still using a larger sensor. Um, and truthfully, for the GM5 GF series cameras, the G100 is basically the modern day variant of that. Um, from the GM5, one of the biggest things people asked uh, at its time, because I was in retail at that point, was they loved the camera, but they wanted a bigger viewfinder. They wanted something that was, you know, a little bit easier to see, uh, that was a little bit better balanced with slightly larger lenses. So things like 45 to 175, stuff like that. Um, and the only way to do that is to bring the camera size up. Uh, so yeah, the G100 is pretty much the modern day, uh, you know, kind of successor to the original GM series. Uh, let's see here. Alan says, I would also love to see the GX or the GM line continue. I, I, I think a lot of people agree we would like to see the GM line continue, but, um, features and spec wise, you're probably not going to see a GM series camera. Uh, if you want something small like that, it's basically the G100. Um, let's see here. Uh, Dave, um, I shoot a lot of landscapes, wild plants and insects, photos and videos using a GH6 and usually bring two lenses, Olympus 12 to 40 and a 60 millimeter macro lens. Also USB batteries, filter, shotgun mic, XLR cable, shotgun mic. Wow. That's a whole lot of stuff that you're bringing with you. Uh, and, and okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're using one of the doctor bags. So when, when like, you know, kind of looking at all of this kit, you know, you, you can see why this is, again, like I said, this is a very loose kind of conversation about it because you, everything I say is going to be one thing of just how it works for me. Um, clearly you can see like Dave's nature has a very different kit than what I would do because if I'm traveling, uh, even if, even if I have to travel with my full kit to, you know, produce a video, capture audio, get everything on the go. Literally, it's basically now the GH6 is my go-to for that. So it's my GH6. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody. Sorry, couldn't get to the mute in time. Um, if I'm creating video content now, the GH6 is my go-to for the vast majority of stuff. Um, it's got my nine millimeter on it. I now am using the uh, SSD recording functionality because I'm recording everything in ProRes now. Uh, and then... Audio wise, I'm either using my XLR one with my Sennheiser AVX for now. Um, I'm looking to change over to the Rode, uh, was it go wireless Two mics uh, soon. And then a white card. That's literally the, the pro kit that I would travel with to do content because most of the stuff now, um, I will end up using the GH six to film in open gate for everything. 
and then I will just do my crops later for nine by 16, 16 by nine, wherever that content's going to go. So I can take advantage of that, you know, the 5.8 K, the higher resolution, I can downscale in, in software in on my laptop and get a really nice clean looking image. Uh, and it just simplifies the whole thing. Uh, as far as power solutions go with this, um, for the GH6, I usually bring a couple of batteries with me for the GH6, but I usually record relatively short clips throughout the time that I'm shooting. Uh, and then with the batteries, as I'm running through them, when the battery gets low in the camera, I pop it out, I plug it into the charger and the charger is actually just plugged right into this guy. So I don't have to bring a wall adapter or anything like that. It's literally just this small USB cable plugs into the, the kind of dock charger. And then that's how I charge my batteries uh, between shooting with it. Um, I, I, I don't do long form, so I don't really need to do that. Uh, you know, kind of running right into the dummy battery, things like that. Uh, let's see here. Derek says, uh, does Panasonic offer color LUTs for vlog, uh, GH5, GH5S, GH6 versions? Uh, and are there correction LUTs or steps for Cinelike D? So we don't offer anything for Cinelike series because Cinelike are typically designed to be, you know, much closer to final. Um, you're not really going to need to do much. That's where the community has developed amazing LUTs, um, you know, for the different color profiles. I would look at some of the Facebook groups and talk to some of the users out there that are creating LUTs. You'll get really good results from a lot of them. Um, as far as Panasonic goes and Lumix, we do have the Vericam LUT packs that are available on our website. Uh, those are designed for vlog. So you have, uh, the 709, um, correction LUT internally that comes with the camera. And then you also have the looks that are available on our website. So, uh, if you just look up Panasonic Lumix or, uh, yeah, Panasonic Vlog LUTs, uh, you'll come to our broadcast page, uh, and they all work. They're all in the .vlt format. So for the GH5 and the GH5S, uh, you can drop the VLTs on there. The GH6, you can drop a uh, .cube file on there. So you don't necessarily need to use it as long as it's at, I think it's 33 point lower. Um, and yeah, uh, we, we do have some of that stuff available. Uh, let's see here. Dave says, and backpack uh, bag is the mic and windscreen won't fit in the doctor bag with everything else. Wow. That is a whole lot of equipment that you are, uh, that you're working with. Uh, Martin says, I had a dream that Panasonic is working on a new GH6 battery with USB C port on the bottom with less runtime, but able to supply more amps. Uh, that would be interesting. Um, I, I can tell you that's probably not something we're working on, but, uh, that's a good idea. Um, we can pass it up to the team and, uh, get them some, uh, some ideas. Um, the battery division probably would be interested, but who am I to say whether or not it's possible or doable for, uh, interchangeable lens cameras like this? Uh, Alan says, I get what you're saying about not trying to support requests, uh, not trying to support requested features. Not every camera needs to be video centric. GX form factor is much easier to fit into a pocket for still shooting. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, hundred percent. I, as a stills first shooter, when I go, like if, if I'm just going out for the day and I just want to bring a camera with me, I, it does become a toss up. If I'm going to have my backpack or I'm on my bike, yeah, I'm going to bring my S5 because I can throw it in the saddlebag. If I'm like going out to dinner or just for, you know, a walk downtown or something like that, it does become a toss up of, do I bring something like my LX 100 Mark II with me? Do I bring a G 100 with me with like my 15 millimeter on there? Because that's one of my favorite lenses in micro four thirds. Um, yeah, there's a hundred percent, a huge benefit for small compact, lightweight cameras. Um, I think just with a lot of it is, you know, a lot of people, it's easy for us to say, you know, we don't want 4k 60 in a camera that's ultra compact cause we don't need it. Well, that's our opinion, but there's going to be a lot of other people that are saying, well, if you can do it, why are you not doing it? So, uh, a lot of that does become a balance for development of cameras and, you know, kind of categories of what you want to go with. Um, right now the G 100, like I said, is if you're looking for something that you can just throw in the bag 
or throw in like a coat pocket, try the G100. If you really liked and loved that GM5 kind of platform, I wouldn't just quickly write off the G100 from the GM5. The GM5 was a fun camera, but it had a lot of little quirks that, while yes, it was small, it wasn't necessarily the most comfortable to shoot with, that the I think the G100 has really kind of refined for that category. Uh, but let's see here. Andy says, uh, on the GH6, every time I switch to a higher data mode, it keeps asking me to switch to SD CF Express, even if it's a save. Uh, asking me... On the GH6, every time I switched to a higher data mode, it kept asking to switch SD CF Express, even if it's saved in a custom mode. Do you think they can be implemented this feature to be saved? I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, Andy, are you saying that... I'm actually very confused on that question. Um, is it that... When you save your camera settings into like C1 or C2, when you go into that, it's asking you to change for SD CF Express. Are you in SSD recording? Um, that's what I'm kind of curious about because if you're if you're on the SSD recording and you're going to higher frame rates, so 120 frames per second, Yes, the 120 frames per second needs to be switched to SD CF Express, and you have to go into a menu to change that. Um, so it, it needs to be actually like changed over in the menu system. Um, that isn't something that, as of at, at least at this point, not something that's going to be just like dropped in for a, a quick button. It has been asked if a quick menu button can be set to, to change that. Um, but if you're looking, um, okay, some more follow up, uh, destination slot to be saved with other settings. Uh, I can check and see, uh, if that is something that's there. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, it, it's as of right now, it's, you can, I think I understand what the question is. I can bring the questions up to our engineers and see if it is something, uh, I know that for those that are using the SSD firmware, if you want to jump into higher frame rate, you do have to manually go in and change the um, uh, storage allocation system. So whether it's going to be SSD or CF Express or SD, um, you do have to do that manually right now. Um, I don't know if it's going to be able to be doing it automatically, uh, but it has been asked. So uh, let's see here. Pete says, in my Manfrotto backpack, GH6, tilt cage, small rig SSD holder, 24-70, to 12-35, to zoom F6, uh, field recorder, Rode NTG5 with blimp, spare CF Express SD, DJI wireless mic, and batteries. Man, y'all carry a lot of stuff with you. Um, paragraphic, we started filming our documentaries in the GH6 when it came out. It's perfect camera for cinematic on-the-go storytelling, checks every box, and wouldn't choose anything else. That is awesome to hear. Chris says, open gate 3.2 full frame or 4.3 super 35, which do you recommend for the S1H and why? Uh, lens crop factor doesn't matter. So, uh, I would say it's going to, on the S1H, it's going to depend on what your subject that you're filming is. If you're doing static work, so, you know, kind of like landscape coverage in video, if you're doing like a talking heads interview, stuff like that, and you want to be able to shoot in a more open gate format, um, that I would use, you know, three by two full frame, use the 6K 24P. If you're doing anything that has situations where you're going to need to be panning uh, or, you know, quick objects moving across the frame, that's where I'd probably switch to the four by three um, Super 35 mode because the rolling shutter is going to be lower when you are using the four by three because you're using the Super 35 region. Uh, sensor readouts faster, rolling shutter effect is much lower. Um, so that, that can work better for a situation where you've got subjects running across the, um, frame or you've got the camera panning. Uh, yeah, that's, that's typically how I address it. Uh, if you're on a camera like the GH6, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, if you use the like 4.4 K, which does do a small little crop, but, uh, yeah, so. 
Uh, let's see here. Jeremy, regarding cube LUTs in the GH6, you suggest 17, 17, 17 over the 33, 33 to reduce banding. GH6 converts 33 to 17 internally and doesn't always... So, yeah, if, if you know enough about LUTs, um, you know, you can load... 33 point LUTs can be loaded. Um, the 17s are probably just going to be more efficient, especially when you're working on a camera that with really any camera, any on-camera monitor or display... Um, you know, you're not going to be able to really do the full advantage of a 65 point or, uh, was it uh, 33 or 66? Um, 17s will be fine, uh, to work with this, uh, if you're loading them into the camera. So, um, Sacred City says, uh, let's say you're using a gimbal with your S5 travel loadout. Uh, do you use the same back backpack or another backpack? Um, I actually use this same backpack. Uh, 90% of the stuff that I do is I travel with this. I think Strawn's put it, uh, I think great at the beginning. If I can't fit it in that bag, it's not coming with me. Um, and I, for the most part, that's a, that's a logic that I take with traveling for anything, whether it's traveling to do a paid job or it's something that I'm going to be traveling more for fun. Uh, if I can't fit the equipment in the bag that I want to bring with me that I enjoy working with, I will pare my kit down. I will look and say, you know, do I really need all these lenses with me? Uh, do I need all of these, you know, extra pieces to go with the kit? Um, when it comes to things like the microphones on the GH6, do I need the XLR one or am I going to be fine plugging into the internal microphone for the content that I'm making? Um, the vast majority of the time, I can tell you, plugging just into the, you know, 3.5 input jack here with something like the, you know, Go Wireless mics, that is more than enough for the vast majority of things that a lot of us are probably recording. If I need dual channel, if I need quad channel with my GH6, that's where, yeah, you know, I will grab my XLR1, I will bring the whole kit... They don't take up that much space, but that usually is how I would approach it. You know, look at the bag that you want to bring and actually plan out what equipment you're going to actually be putting there and using on site. I'm willing to bet if all of us took a, you know, took stock the next event that you work or the next time you take your equipment out on the road, take stock of what equipment never gets touched when you bring it you'll probably find that a lot of times you will get out there and realize that like three quarters of the stuff that you bring, you don't actually ever end up using. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how do you import your, uh, oh, wow. Okay. Chat jumped again. Um, the changing of the destination recording. Uh, why does GH6 not change and you select a higher data rate? I, I, I have to find out the exact reasoning behind it right now, but as of right now, yes, you do have to, it is a manual change between them. Um, so this, that is just how it is right now. Um, we have asked to make it easier to, you know, either program that button to be selectable or if possible, have it refined to where it can auto switch it out. Um, I, I honestly just don't know if, uh, you know, what the capabilities are there because I'm not a software engineer. I don't know what, you know, how those systems are all working. So I don't want to give anyone kind of, uh, you know, false hope or, you know, say no that it can't happen because I truly don't know. Um, Sacred City says, how do you import your GH6 videos? Drag and drop. I use Lightroom Classic and now I've got a bug where it imports the videos on a different date. Um, 90% of the time when I'm working, when I get back from a, a shoot or travel or something like that, there's two things that I typically do. I will take whatever media I've been working with on the camera. So for the GH6, it's been the SSDs. I plug them into my desktop and I offload them onto uh, the SanDisk Pro Blade system. Um, that's what I've been using now for the last couple of weeks for my uh, desktop and on-the-go storage uh, because I can use these mags. And yeah, they get directly copied from the card uh, on the computer right into uh, the actual dock. I can't pull it up because it's actually you know running my Lightroom catalog right now. 
Uh, so that's what I will do first. I won't do importing through a program um, because typically I end up running into either, you know, it, if I forget to change the import settings for a certain job, I can end up screwing everything up because, you know, say I left rename all the files on, then we'll, all of those files that I just imported are renamed and I have to do it all over again. Uh, so yeah, I manually import everything, copying paste, uh, to my external storage. And then, then I will go into Lightroom for my photos and actually just tell it, you know, import, go to that location, grab that folder, and then just add to catalog. Um, it's a bit more of, I'd say like an older school way of doing it before we had programs that would, you know, very easily just import photos for us and create folder hierarchies and everything. Um, that's usually what I do. That also avoids any software, you know, going in there and potentially changing the date because it goes to import date or last modified date, stuff like that. Um, because it's all just moved onto my storage. Uh, and then after that, the card that I was, was using for it, um, I will have the footage backed up to, uh, my NAS as a secondary backup. And then I format the card after that. Um, I'm not one of those that will carry around 7,000 SD cards or CF Express cards that have backups on them because they're expensive and solid state storage and spinning storage has been pretty reliable for everything that we pretty much need. Uh, and then I do also cloud backup too. Uh, let's see here. Uh, where can I buy a uh, Lumix backpack? Uh, unfortunately, those are not for sale. Uh, those were for, uh, our internal, uh, our team when we launched the GH6, um, couple of us that have worked on the project, we, we went and got them done. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see here. I need to adopt that kind of bag logic. Yep. Um, with Andy, Martin and Jeremy, I think all of us agree that if we were able to speed up the, uh, changing the, uh, how fast it is to change the uh, storage media. That's definitely a nice advantage. It has been brought up. The engineers do know about it. So yes. Um, do you have a G9? I do have a G9, just not on me as of right now. So if you have a question about it, feel free to ask. Uh, and that was, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce your name. I'm so sorry. Uh, let's see here. Similar to, uh, what if you pop out SD cards, will it switch to CF automatically? Uh, that actually will work, yes. Um, Jeremy says, similar to DR Boost, why not have it automatically turn on and off as the ISO thresholds? Uh, so with DR Boost, I know for one thing, when it comes to the video side, the reason why it is not an automatic change is because there are times where you don't, you may not want to use it in those higher ISO. So if it's an automatic change, you would still have to use a user interface or input to turn it off. Um, so it's really, it's a 50% are going to like it the way it is. 50% are going to want it automatic and neither one's really going to be the correct way to do it because everyone's got their own kind of style with it. Um, yeah. So like, that's just kind of why. Uh, as far as going up to like 120 frame, because, you know, dynamic rate, uh, the DR boost functionality only works up till 60. Um, that is something that we have asked, uh, as well, similar in vain to the, um, SSD and then the, uh, storage media changing. Uh, Stron says always manually copy paste, control your data, know where it lives. Yep. That's a pretty good logic. I like to take, especially if you're in an Apple ecosystem, because if you do that, it doesn't just get locked away in, you know, Apple's photos folders and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see here. So you said, if you're using uh, windows, hold right click mouse, drag with the option to copy or move. Yeah. Uh, I typically just go in control a, uh, control C and then go to my location, control V and paste. Um, just remember whenever you're copying, make sure you actually eject the SD cards. Uh, you may not have your computer set up in the way that it actually copies everything. It could only be putting a shortcut and then it slowly does the copy in the background. Uh, when you force eject a card or you actually just eject media, that will actually close the, uh, the files out that need to be moved. Um, 
Martin says, you do not get it. We don't want to have a faster way to change the storage. We want the camera to ignore that setting when we have hikes. No, I, 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 I understood um, what the question is, Martin. I, I don't know if it's possible. It has been asked, though. Um, that's what I was saying, is that, yes, I, I did understand. You want it to not necessarily have to make the change. The thing is, is that as far as the storage goes, right now, this is just how it works. Um, we've asked them to investigate and look at, can it be done where it just automatically allows when you change the uh, frame rates? Can you do that to have it just automatically change it out? In the meantime, we've also asked them if that's going to take a while, if it's even possible to allow for a like, you know, faster way to get into the changing menu. Um, let's see here. FC says, uh, this is just dragging. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, one of the last things that, uh, I wanted to kind of bring up about, you know, kind of the, the idea of traveling with, with the cameras and stuff like that is when we're out in the field and, you know, we're, we're kind of working, this kind of leans, I think more towards the, I'd say probably more casual, maybe not a paid application of traveling, uh, is, is traveling with, obviously, you know, we all have phones for the most part, um, using the, the tools that our phones have for being able to on the go, be able to edit, work with our files, sync them up online so that if you get that one photo and you're really excited about it, you want to share it to everybody, you can just do your editing on something like this and then be able to send it out. Um, with all of the modern Lumix cameras, if you are traveling with them, they all have the ability to link up Bluetooth to your mobile device, whether you're using an iOS device or you're using an Android device, you've got that flexibility. Um, what that allows me to do, especially if I'm traveling is I can take geolocation information now over Bluetooth and always have all of my photos geolocated uh, throughout the entire time that I'm shooting. I don't have to do it the old way where it was, you sync the app and the, the camera, you sync the time, the phone starts to log locations throughout time and then it sends it over into the camera. Uh, now it just does it passively with Bluetooth. Um, note on that is that if you are an iOS user, you have to make sure that you have background app uh, capabilities enabled. Um, that's where sometimes it would lose a connection if you just close the app or whatever. But, uh, the other advantage here is a lot of editing solutions now. So I still am an Adobe user. Uh, so that means I use Lightroom, Lightroom mobile, um, all of those different platforms being able to send the full high res raw files over to my device where I can work on, you know, Lightroom mobile right from my phone here and then have all of those photos actually shared in the edited sense right back onto my home computer. So I have all of my edits done here and then have it sync up to the cloud so that when I get home and I open my Lightroom catalog, uh, that would be the wrong screen. When I open my Lightroom catalog, I've got all of my edits already done right here for me. It, it, it is a very very useful thing if you've got the option to use any kind of the software that allows you to cloud sync everything in an actual editing program. I know a lot of people are against, you know, paying for subscription service for software, um, but just there are some advantages. If you've got recommendations for working and editing photos on the go, um, definitely drop them in the chat. Let other people know, because I know everyone is always looking for the next, you know, kind of software that may fix their issues and the way you catalog and work with files. So, um, yeah, so working on the go with these, you've got so many different options now with a lot of mobile devices and stuff, being able to edit and then have everything synced online, uh, for those edits. Um, where is my selection? And yeah, so for those, like I said, with, with this past particular trip into Japan, this is where I was able to actually, you know, all of the photos that are in here right now were originally loaded onto my mobile device and then synced online through the catalog. So I'm able to actually work with these as soon as I get home and actually be able to just kind of immediately start playing around with these photos without having to go through, you know, 
loading, importing them all on here. I did it all on the go. And actually, all the edits were done on the mobile device and then just, you know, synced on, on the PC. So I had that ability to just kind of jump through all of this. Uh, it makes things really easy when you're traveling, especially if you're more in on the photography side. Um, video side, I wouldn't say there are many great video editing tools that uh, mobile devices, I think, work incredibly well with. Uh, if you have a really good, uh, I, you know, kind of recommendation for video editing software, definitely let people know in the chat that, you know, would work well on a mobile device. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff. The entire week that I was in Japan, and this is ultimately, I think, one of the takeaways I want to provide for some people here is a lot of us get so caught up with a lot of our equipment. You know, we, we want to bring the best camera. We want to make sure that we're covered for every entire situation, every moment that we could possibly think of while we're on the go. Um, but more importantly, if you're going out and you're traveling, capturing photos, creating memories, using the cameras that we have to, you know, take bite-sized pieces of, of, you know, experiences that we were working on is a really important thing to keep remembering. The faster you can get them into something like your mobile device to get them up into a cloud so that they're stored immediately makes things easier, especially if you're traveling and you want to be able to share it with family and friends. Um, I think our system makes it pretty simple and straightforward to do that without having to think too much about it. I can just have them, you know, quietly in the background, loading to my phone from my camera and already having Lightroom automatically import them so that when I get home, I'm not having to spend three hours doing, you know, copy and paste. That said, I still do all of that because I still have all of the stuff backed up. Uh, I don't just rely on the cloud uh, service, but we have the tools to be able to go out there and create some really cool stuff. And I would challenge everybody the next time you go out with your camera equipment and you want to just, you know, kind of have a relaxing time. You're not really doing it for paid or anything like that. Try challenging yourself to use something like a single focal length and try to adjust your perspective. Try playing around with what kind of things you can, you can actually like go out and, and create. Um, I think a lot of people would be surprised if you're used to shooting a 24 to 70, um, being able to actually just pick a single focal length that maybe you're not normally shooting, you'll get some pretty cool shots, um, that maybe you didn't expect you'd be able to get. And you still have the ability to kind of jump in there, adjust all the editing and change the field of view for what you need. Um, let's see here. Um... Uh, is there any update for the GH5 Mark II? Uh, any, uh, any news about it? I don't know if there are any updates right now for the GH5 Mark II. Um, I think, like I said earlier, e even if I did know, I wouldn't really be able to talk about it anyway. Um, but I'm not sure if there's anything that I can think of right now. Um, let's see here. Um... Walkabout says, use Affinity Photo and sync with iCloud, able to edit Mac or iPad. It's a good option there. Um, FC, uh, oh, I think you're looking at the, this one. Uh, yeah, that's, I actually think, so this photo has been edited. So if I go back to, that's what it was originally. And then, actually, that's what it was originally because I was massively, you know, off angle there. And then, yeah, just edit it out. Lots of flexibility in the raw files. I think a lot of people may forget how much flexibility you have uh, with raw files these days for doing some, some edits there. Uh, Zickert says, quick heads up, Amazon Drive Cloud is closing down. So if anyone uses that for photo storage, get your photos off it, basically. Yeah, um, that's a good thing to keep in mind. JC, uh, I've had trouble having a BGH1 Ethernet and a GH6 USB on Lumix Tether at the same time. Is it possible or only one camera at a time via USB-C? Uh, I'm fairly certain you were able to do both at the same time. Uh, JC, if you can let me know what um, computer, what um, OS you're using, 
I can try to mimic it on my side because I've got Windows and Mac computers to play around with uh, and be able to see here. Uh, let's see here. Martin says, please raise this top priority. In fact, I'm surprised that it wasn't already addressed. Can't imagine a reason why this can't be redesigned. Uh, and while you were there, um, can you remove the message that we need high performance PCs for this type of recording? I, I get the logic there, wanting to see things like, you know, the note about needing a higher performance PC. Um, you have to remember too, that, uh, there are a lot of people that purchase cameras that don't know these things and won't read the manual. So there are certain things that do, that are in there for the greater good of all users that may not be as experienced as a lot of us uh, for some of these things. But all of this feedback is what gets brought up and shared in with our teams. So yeah, that was that was a, f a fun conversation. Um, I know, like I was saying, uh, okay, JC says Mac OS is Monterey for both camera on Lumix Tether. Okay, uh, JC, I will take a look into that. Um, I do have a MacBook that is running Monterey. Uh, and I will see if I can recreate it, um, see if I can find out what's going on with network and USB. As far as I know, you can do them both together, but I've been working in a PC environment. So, um, yeah, anyway, so thank you everybody. I know this was a very different, uh, kind of conversation than we've had before. We meandered a bit, um, and it was just kind of more of a flowing conversation. Um, but I'm really happy that everyone, you know, jumped in and had a, a, a good set of conversations in the chat. Um, all the feedback is what we love hearing in this back and forth, you know, having conversations with each other, helping each out, each other out, pointing out, you know, things that maybe would help another user, uh, is, is awesome. So I'm super appreciative of everybody, you know, kind of being active in the chat. It's, it's super fun. Um, we will be back live again next Thursday at, um, 2 PM Eastern time. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I would really love to, uh, have that update ready on the, the page already for next week's stream. I just haven't had a chance to get around to it. So, um, yeah, we will be live next Thursday, 2 PM Eastern time. Uh, the link should be going up shortly. And, uh, yeah, if you have questions or recommendations for future streams, you can always email us at lumixlive at us.panasonic.com or you can leave your recommendations in the comment section after the video is posted. Uh, and we do read those, we do check them so that we can, um, you know, kind of come up with content that actually is relevant for what all of you are looking for. Uh, so yeah, with that, I hope everyone has a really good rest of your day, uh, has a good weekend, and uh, yeah, we'll see you all next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Take care, everybody.